welcome to Grace Church Online. It is great to have you with us. My name is James and I'm an elder on the church's leadership team. And today, I'm your host. If you're joining us for the first time, I want to give you a particularly warm welcome. It's great that you found us and we really hope that you enjoy worshipping God together with us today. Why not give yourself a shout out in the comments facility on the right hand side of the screen? Say hi, we'll say hi back and welcome you properly and make sure that you feel fully part of things. We use the comments facility throughout the service for things like sharing prayers, words, pictures, prophecy, to encourage each other and build each other up in our worship of Jesus. So please do get involved. After the service, we have a Zoom coffee and chat. So make sure you get across to that. It'd be great to meet you and chat to you uh, and just be family together. If you're joining us today and you're alone, we want you to know that you are not alone, that we are joining with you online. And most importantly, God is with you. If you're joining as a family, why not make sure that the whole family are together, all the kids, everyone in the home, worshipping Jesus together, singing the songs, praying the prayers, encouraging each other, blessing each other. In today's service, we also have communion. So now's the moment to make sure that you've got emblems for bread and wine that you can use a little bit later on in our service as we share communion together. Today, Sheila has prepared our worship for us got a number of songs to sing so let me hand over to Sheila. Hi Grace Church, how are you all? Hope you're all well. We're doing well here, surviving to week five of the lockdown and just want to remind you this morning of something that helps me in times of challenge and it's Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the maker of heaven and earth. I just want to encourage you this morning with the songs that I've chosen to lift your eyes to the mountains, to trust in our God, the one who keeps us, the one who shades us. He doesn't fall asleep on the job. So let's lift up our eyes this morning and worship our God. What are you turning? Into the darkness you shine 
and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing craze This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be Throne. What other king leaves his throne? 
now it's time to share communion together. This is one of those moments in which we're probably feeling a physical distance and separation more keenly than ever. Normally on a Sunday morning, we'd gather around the communion stations and in small circles, we'd share physically bread and wine with each other. We'd be family together on a Sunday morning. It's the one thing that we're not able to do right now. And it's good for us to feel that separation and that longing in our hearts to be back together again. But right now, we're doing communion this way, but we do so with the hope of what it's gonna be like when we do join together as a family. How exciting is that gonna be? How fantastic and how much will we celebrate? In a second, I'm gonna read from 1 Corinthians 11, where's Paul's instruction to the Corinthian church on taking communion. If you're a Christian, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, if you have real faith in him and a relationship with him, then communion is for you and we'd encourage you to take part as well. Start sharing the bread with each other, start taking the wine. And after I've read from 1 Corinthians, then I'll pray for all of us. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're following Jesus' instruction in doing this. We don't just remember a man who was good and kind and who died. We celebrate a savior who beat death, who conquered sin, who rose again, and we cannot wait until his return. That's what communion represents to us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you laid down your life, that you allowed your body to be broken and your blood to be shed for us, to save a people, to win a people for God. You brought us into the family of God. Thank you, Lord, that you did so willingly. No one forced you to the cross. You did so of your own accord. And Lord Jesus, we praise you and celebrate the fact that you have beaten death and sin and you rose from the dead. And we look forward to the day when you return. Lord Jesus, as we take communion now, different places strung out, I ask for your blessing on each and every person who is online right now. Bless them. I pray for physical healing. I pray for emotional healing. Let your blessing and your presence rest heavily with them. And I ask this in your powerful name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
beautiful name it is the name of Jesus what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus good morning Grace Church have you ever heard of the marshmallow test it's a psychology test from the late 1960s. You give a young child a marshmallow and tell them they can either eat it straight away or if they wait about five minutes, then they'll have another one so they'll get two. You put the marshmallow in front of them and walk away and leave them to it. I thought it would be fun for us to do our own marshmallow test, not because of the psychology lesson that we might get from it, but I think there's a little encouragement for each one of us to get from this test too. So today I will need some marshmallows and some children. Well, although they didn't eat the marshmallows and they even tried not to look at them, you could tell they had marshmallows on their minds. So aside from the psychology lesson, what can it mean for us? Well, last Sunday morning during our worship time, somebody shared a picture. It was typed into the online chat. It was a picture of people feeling afraid as they watched the news, but they stopped watching the news and instead they worship Jesus and their fears went away. And that's what inspired me to do the marshmallow test this morning. Many things in life grab our attention. It's easy to allow those things to become our focus to consume us. And when we do, we can so easily be overcome with fear, with other negative emotions, worry and anxiety and stress. So let's be encouraged, Grace Church, by the picture that was shared last Sunday to switch off the news or whatever that thing is that consumes you and becomes your focus and instead to worship Jesus. And as Jesus becomes our focus, our fears will go away. As David said in Psalm 23, for even when your path takes me through the valley of deepest darkness, fear will not conquer me for you already have. Hi, Grace Church. We're here with one of our frontline worker interviews and we've got the wonderful Lorraine and fabulous Kim joining with us this morning. Thank you both so much for being here. Why don't you introduce yourselves to your Grace Church family and tell us what you're doing on the front line. Hi, I'm Lorraine Chaquena and I'm a secondary school teacher at St Paul's Catholic School. I'm uh, Kim Fraser and I'm a primary school teacher at St Mary and St Giles School. Wonderful. So two teachers, a shout out to our other Grace Church teachers as well. We're really aware of how tough these last weeks have been for teaching staff. Uh, first of all, before we say anything else, we want to say a big thank you. We want to say well done. We're cheering you on and we're praying for you because we appreciate it must be really tricky for you at this time. Well, why don't you start us off with uh, painting a picture, describing for us what being a teacher has been like over these uh, last few weeks. Kim, why don't you start us off with that? So obviously we have the message that schools were shutting really quickly um, and that last day was pretty horrific. Um, emotional, really. The children didn't really understand what was going on. Um, lots of tears and hugs and things. So, that, you know, in that respect, really emotional um but since then you know we've been setting work for children online um putting things on the website slightly different um we don't do online videos or anything like that 
but every day I make phone calls to the children in my class and their parents. So over the course of the week, I phone every child and talk to them. Um, so obviously we're just keeping, making sure they're doing okay. They're, they're feeling okay. Parents are okay as well and things like that. So it's been a case of phoning every day. And then um, over the Easter holidays, second week of the Easter holidays, I was in school with the key worker children um, doing bits and pieces and activities with them but there's difficulties there of trying to keep them socially distant they don't want to they want to be close to their friends um, but also keeping them happy and trying to avoid conversations with them be about what's going on because because they're frontline worker children they know what's happening mm -hmm. yeah so it's interesting to think of you as a teacher at home sometimes and then in school sometimes yeah. Lorraine what's it been like for you as a teacher over these last weeks right um with secondary schools well just like with kim we set the work online and um we are keeping in touch with the children online as well each day um we prepare lessons for the children um as if it was a normal school day so each subject that they would have had they've got work that has been set for them the challenge um just like kim said as well is preparing lessons that they can access and they're able to do on their own. Mm -hmm. And um, some are finding it quite challenging. We, they are supposed to email the work back to us. So the response at the moment has been too great. We're investigating obviously to find out what's happening. But um, um, some are coping, but unfortunately a lot of them are not. Yeah, so thinking about what life's been like uh, for you as teachers, that sounds tough, it sounds difficult to um, He's in school sometimes and setting work online and interacting with, with the students online. How do you feel children and students are coping? Um, yeah, how are they getting on from your perspective? Um, well, I think for some children, they're seeing this as an extended holiday. So some are, you know, but a lot of children are really struggling. Um, had a number of children, particularly this week, who've come on the phone and sort of said, when are we going back to school? I miss you and things like that. Um, and for our SEN children, our children with those special needs, they're really struggling to one, understand what's going on and two, complete the work. Yeah, gosh. What about you, Lorraine? Have you seen anything particularly? Um, with regards to the special needs children, what we're finding is they, have, they lack motivation mm -hmm. because the work we're setting, they're not able to access on their own they've pretty much given up. Parents are also struggling because they're in touch with us and obviously expressing their concerns and that my child, I don't know what to do to motivate them. I don't know how to explain the work to them. So it's, it's really difficult because obviously they've got their own needs and their fears, their anxieties mm -hmm. and setting work for them online and expecting them to complete it, it's all become a, a bit too much for them. So. Um, I don't know how we'll continue, but um, yes, they're finding it really, really difficult. Yeah. Okay, well, that's given us lots to pray for, to pray for you guys as teachers, uh, but also to pray for the, the students as they have all sorts of challenges and struggle in all sorts of ways. We can pray, can't we, Grace Church? Pray for our schools, pray for the teachers, pray for the students, pray for the parents as well. Um, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy days to come and talk with us uh, again thank you again well done and uh, yes yeah, so a, a big goodbye to your Grace Church family bye bye okay let me share a couple of notices with you first of all if you're new here we're really glad that you joined us and we hope that you enjoyed the service so far we'd love to connect with you further so if you go across to our website which is www.gracechurchmiltonkeens.org, you can find out more about us, what we stand for and the life of the church. Particularly, sign up to the mailing list. Those emails go out to all our subscribers and give you more information about what's going on in the life of the church. Zoom chats, online services, meetings, resources, make sure you sign up for the mailing list. Secondly, giving. If you're a Grace Church member and you're giving regularly, thank you. We really appreciate your faithfulness. As you know, giving is part of our worship. We worship God with all that we have and with all that we are. So thank you for your faithfulness. If you'd like to make a one-off donation, also if you go to the website, look for the giving tab and you'll find all the information you need there to be able to give online. 
Okay, now it's time for our sermon. Tim is speaking to us today, who's our lead elder, and he's preaching the second sermon in the series on Philippians. Let's listen to Tim now. Hi, and thanks for being with us today. We're into our second week in our Philippians series. Philippians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul and is now found in the New Testament. So grab a Bible if you've got one or Google Philippians and have this letter open in front of you as we go through some of the verses found in this passage today. And you can have a look at what the words are saying as we read them. Kids, we've got another poster for you to make for you and your family. So get pens and paper ready and I'll be giving you our phrase for the poster in just a few moments time. Today we're going to look at eight more verses starting at verse nine. So let's open our Bibles and before we read, let's pray. Jesus, we pray right now you would come. You would come and speak to every single one of us, that your word would come alive in our hearts and in our lives, that you would change us and challenge us. I pray for myself, Holy Spirit, as I preach right now, anoint me and equip me to be able to share your word. And God, in all we pray that you would be glorified. Amen. Amen. Well, let's begin by reading just the first couple of verses from our passage for today. We're starting from verse nine, where the the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter, he says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what's best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Well, last week we heard that Paul is praying a lot. He's in prison as he writes this letter. He can't get to the Philippians himself, but God can. And so praying is the only thing Paul can do for this church. And actually it's the very best thing he can do and we can do for the church. And we get some insight in these words as to what Paul is praying. That love would abound more and more. You know the phrase, uh, sometimes less is more. Well, whenever I hear people say that, I can't help but think, and and perhaps this is the little brother in me, I I can't help but think, yes, but sometimes more is more. Sometimes less is more, sometimes more is more. This is one occasion at least that more is more, love, love abounding, love abounding more and more. Kids, that's our phrase for this week's poster, that your love may abound more and more. We'll put the words in the text just here so you can see how it's spelt, but what a great reminder for you and your family over the week, that our love would abound more and more. What a great prayer to pray and have prayed over you. What a great prayer we can pray for each other that our love would abound more and more. And this abounding love we read in these early verses, it has a huge impact. It gives glory to God, it changes the world, and it also changes us. If you look closely into these verses, Paul references two specific effects this abounding love has on us. An ability to discern what's best and also fruitfulness. As our love abounds more and more, we're able to discern what's best and we're able to be increasingly fruitful. And I think the next few verses we'll get into now give us a big clue as to what Paul considers is best, what the best use of our life could be and where God would want us to be most fruitful. So let's continue reading from verse 12 through to verse 16. Now I want you to know brothers that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. 
because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and without fear. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing I'm put here for the defence of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. So this love abounding more and more will help us discern the very best focus we could ever have in our lives. It will lead us to be fruitful in this one key area Paul cares about more than anything else, the advance of the gospel. I find it awesome and so inspiring that the Apostle Paul hasn't lost his focus. He hasn't lost sight of the goal. Five years he's been in prison, locked down to the extreme, isolated, alone, separated from friends, family, from his mission field, the work that he's been giving his all to. So many hopes and dreams seemingly lost. He had plans to reach the gospel into into the very corners of the, the empire and beyond, but now he's stuck. So let's just imagine how, mu- that, how that must have felt for him, how frustrating, how devastating, how much loss, so many missed opportunities. Yet what Paul is aiming for, what his heart is yearning for, what he still holds as the chief aim of his life remains, that the good news of the gospel is proclaimed. And in fact, here's the amazing reality that I want to spend our time considering and applying to our own situation, is that Paul is able to say this, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. We might ask, what Paul? What are you saying? That you being in prison has caused Jesus to be shared more? What, that the you not going to all these cities and all these nations is causing an even greater spread of the gospel? Yes. This is not Paul finding a silver lining. This is not stoicism. This is not British stiff upper lip here where he's kind of saying, oh, well, plenty more fish in the sea or whistle while you work or every cloud has a silver lining. No, this is the evidence Paul has seen. That what may have frustrated him to his core, despite the personal cost and pain and difficulty through Paul's lockdown, God has used that to do something bigger. Friends, here's the very simple truth I feel God would say to us out of these verses today. What if the same is true for us? Actually, not what if, I feel God would say to Grace Church Milton Keynes, to his church as a whole, what has happened and is happening to us and to this world will actually serve to advance the gospel. Here's the deal. God's not lost his focus. God's plans and purposes are not wrecked or restricted. Philippians 1 is calling us to turn our gaze upwards and outwards from the hardships and sufferings and trials we're facing to see that the plan of King Jesus is still on track, that God would use even these moments, especially these moments, to cause his light and hope and grace to spread forth even more, that we will also say, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. I just think of being in year nine at school. For me, where I lived, that was the first year of big school. And what I experienced was nothing like Paul endured or like many of us are suffering with the coronavirus, but I'd felt challenged by God 
to live openly as a Christian, to share my faith in school, to try as best as I could with lots of mistakes along the way, to make sure church Tim and school Tim were much more the same person. And so I would try and share my faith, I'd try and be open about being a Christian. And if you ever have, have any memory at all of being 13 years old in high school, you'll know how painful that can be. And I remember one day standing in front of my whole class, I was giving some sort of announcement that the teacher had asked me to share. And this girl, Beverly, Beverly suddenly burst out laughing. And she called out in front of everyone, cackling and hollering about how I was a Christian. And it was excruciating in how it pressed all of my insecurity buttons. And I can only imagine what colour I turned. But in a funny way, Beverly helped. Suddenly, loads of people were asking me about my faith. It probably tipped me off the fence a bit in being open and upfront about Jesus like I knew I wanted to be. I was able to share the gospel with loads of people at that school in the midst of stuffing it up lots of times too. Church, I feel God would open our eyes to see he has a plan. He wants to use these moments to make it clear to everyone, as Paul says, that we would become confident in the Lord. We would dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. That we, like Paul, can discern what's best. That as verse 18 puts it, the important thing is that in every way, Christ is preached. Paul seems to have done two things. Two things I want to encourage us to do too. Firstly, to share wherever you are. Share wherever you are. The brilliant example Paul sets us is whether you're on a church planting mission trip abroad or if you're on a stage preaching to hundreds of people or if you're in a prison cell, you can still share Jesus. The same is true for us too. We can share right where we are. Paul did this so effectively, he was able to say that it's become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. You can't keep much hidden in prison, can you? Especially from the guards. Imagine how it was for these soldiers on guard over Paul, taking it in turns to watch him, perhaps bringing him food and water, moving him around the prison, observing his interactions with visitors, even how Paul held himself on trial or even when he was suffering cruelty. In all the watching, in all the time spent near him with Paul, it caused these guards to see something of Christ. And we can think, what did Paul what did Paul say to these guards? We don't know, but I bet he told them about Jesus. I bet he shared the gospel. I bet he loved these guards as best as he could. In the fire service where I used to work, it, it's not quite like prison, but you do everything with the same few people. And again, it led to some painful and tough moments on a few occasions. I will remember to my dying day, the look on their faces, the utter disbelief and mockery and hilarity that Sam and I, at 19 and 20 years old, that we hadn't slept together. And the exposure of that, as it was talked about, the ridicule, the grief they gave me, and yet it showed them that I really meant what I believed. It, in a small way, helped the gospel be shared. I then got to time and time again talk about faith, talk about hope, talk about the reality of God with these same guys. Grace Church, in our lockdown, how can we 
share wherever we are? How can we share Jesus with those around us? We might have family members spending more time with us than ever before, observing how we cope under pressure. It might be colleagues seeing you under a whole new level of stress. It might be we're able to spend more time on the phone or time online with people in a new way that brings new opportunities. For lots of us, our world has shrunk to be very small. But I think an amazing opportunity has been presented to us in these days to share Jesus. I think with our neighbours, those living just a few paces away from us, never has there been a better excuse to knock on the door and to say hi or to drop a card through the door. With work, colleagues, or even with strangers, never has creative kindness been more relevant. How can we share Jesus wherever we are? And this brings us on to the second thing Paul seems to have done that we can too. To move out from fear. To dare to share. Dare to share. Paul speaks of being set free from fear. Of being set free from fear in others. And we see it evidenced in Paul himself. Paul had got past the point of worrying about what others think. His imprisonment, his possible execution brings it all into focus for him. There's no point letting up. There's no point playing it slow or playing it safe. Grace Church is not the same true for us. Surely now is the best opportunity we've ever had to share about life and death and hope. Surely if ever there was a time for people to consider the big questions of faith and truth, this is it. Let's not play it safe. Let's not play it slow. Let's share Jesus as much as we can with as many as we can. I love the quote from John Wesley where he says, you have nothing to do but save souls. Therefore, spend and be spent in this work. Some of us might relate to having nothing to do. Some of us might be busier than we've ever been before. Either way, in every way, Christ can be preached. Souls can be saved. Let's spend and be spent in this work. I love that word dare, dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear, Paul writes. The root word here is about boldness and there's a challenge set before us in these words. Do we dare? Do we dare to share Jesus? There's so much we could say about fear. Fear is real, but it doesn't, it mustn't define us. Jesus' love, it casts out our fear. Our fear is so often linked to our perspective as our view of Christ changes, as our love abounds more and more. Our fear of other things lessens as we fear and revere our awesome God. With Paul stuck in this prison, as he writes this letter, let's remember what happened another time he was in prison. Actually, another time he was in prison in Philippi. We can read about in Acts 16, verses 25 and 26, where it says, About midnight, Paul and Silas, that's his friend uh, who was with him, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake and the foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once, the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. If God could release Paul from that prison, he could release him now. Paul doesn't need to fear. God 
has got a plan. He's carrying on his good work to completion. But the goal is not whether Paul gets out of prison or not. No, then in Acts 16, and now as Paul writes this letter, the goal is the gospel. In Acts 16, the jailer and his whole household in Philippi get saved. And you've got to think Paul's remembering that experience. He's probably thinking of the jailer even as he writes this letter. Paul knows he doesn't need to fear and we don't need to fear. The goal is not getting out of lockdown. The goal is not surviving coronavirus. No, the goal, our focus, our fruitfulness is that we can dare to share Jesus wherever we are. And we can see God do amazing things. Two steps I want to encourage us all to take in these days ahead. Firstly, think differently about where you are. In your home, on your street, even on Zoom, with family members and friends, in your shrunken world. What we could see as a restriction, God is wanting to use as an opportunity. Allow God to open your eyes to see these opportunities all around us. That to the whole palace guard or to the whole of your street or to the classroom of friends you have or that group of work colleagues or to your whole household, that the gospel would be made clear, that Christ would be preached, that we would share wherever we are. And the second step is dare to share. Take steps out you may have never taken before. Remember the power of God to do awesome, earth-shaking, prison wall-shattering things as we step out for him. Get perspective on this unique opportunity and the absolute priority of the gospel. Three very concrete ways we can all dare to share Jesus wherever we are. Firstly, creative kindness. Do something small or something extravagant that is kind to those in your smaller and shrunken world. Pray for Holy Spirit inspiration or steal ideas from others and go for it. Make it happen. Secondly, pray for help. Pray for healing. As you hear of people who are sick or struggling, offer to pray. Offer to pray there and then. Offer to pray later on, then give a follow up afterwards. Let's pray. And then thirdly, third way we can dare, dare to share is Alpha, the Alpha course running online here at Grace Church starting on the 12th of May. Let's take a risk. Let's dare to share. Let's invite people to Alpha online. It's as risky, it's as scary as a WhatsApp message that gets ignored. It's a card through a door. It's a conversation where someone might say no, but they might say yes. Let's dare to share. I love the story of Joseph from Genesis. It's the first book in the Bible. And Joseph, he endured some pretty serious lockdown too. He had to travel through incredible hardship. But right at the end of the story, he's able to say this. This is Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done. The saving of many lives. That's Paul's story too. And it can be our story as well. Grace Church, whilst we're still in our lockdown, whilst we're facing hardship, death, grief, financial strains and all sorts of troubles, can we trust that in the midst of it all, God can use it? That we could say what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. We could say God intended it for good to accomplish what's now being done, the saving of many lives. What looks like restriction and difficulty can be turned by God into a huge gospel opportunity as we dare to share wherever we are. Let's pray as we close. Thanks so much for listening. 
Let's just pray right now. Lord, thank you so much that you want our love to abound more and more. Thank you so much. It's not about duty. It's not about following rules. It's about love. And we pray right now in these moments of lockdown and difficulty, we pray our story would be the same as Joseph and would be the same as the Apostle Paul, that we could say, Lord, what's happened to me? It's actually served to advance the gospel. God, help us share wherever we are in our shrunken world with work colleagues, with family members on our street. Lord, open our eyes to opportunities. Let us dare to share. Give us boldness, Lord. Give us great courage to step out. We pray for alpha invites. We pray for creative kindness. We pray for healing. Lord, do it through us. We say, Lord, send us out into this world for the advance of the gospel, we pray. Do it in us, God, for your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for being involved in our service today. A big thank you to Sheila for organising worship, James for doing uh, communion. Thanks for you being involved and joining with us in our homes. Loom bands are a craze for us at the moment. And uh, we want to invite you to get involved in our Zoom chat, which is going to be starting around 11.30 or whenever this service ends. Do stay involved in this service for two Quick notices that are coming up, one about the Alpha course, we really want to encourage you to be involved as Alpha starts online. And then also listen in to Simon Holly, who's going to be sharing about the Catalyst Crisis Fund. Hopefully you've seen the email about that recently over the last few days, but do watch that video and be involved in that as you feel led. Thanks so much for being part of our Sunday service and may God bless you. Cheers. Alpha is moving online right across the world. I'm really excited because Grace Church are starting two Alpha online sessions on Tuesday the 12th of May. We'll be doing one at midday so you can grab your lunch and come along and we'll be doing the other one in the evenings starting at 8. We'll be using Zoom to meet, we'll watch a film series together and then we'll go into groups for discussion. So why not invite a friend or colleague, someone in your family or a neighbour? So many people have got big questions right now and a bit more time than usual. You could come along yourself, even if you've been a Christian for ages. It's good to come together and explore the big questions of life. Here's a really quick interview with a couple of guys who came along last time. So joining me here today on Zoom are Lindsay and Paul. Say hello. 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 <laughs> Thanks very much for coming along. I've invited Lindsay and Paul along because they came to the last Alpha course. Now we started it in the pub, but due to coronavirus, we had to finish it online. So first of all, um, Paul, how did you hear about the Alpha course? There was a friend at work. Um, he suggested that we go along, um, find out what it's all about. And I thought, yeah, great, give it a go. Okay, and Lindsay, why did you agree to, to go along with him? Well, my uncle had died suddenly last year and I had a lot of questions. And the main one was, what happens afterwards? Like, what is the meaning of life? And it just seemed like the right time to actually start exploring this. Fantastic, great. And um, Paul, what did you enjoy most about the course? I think for me initially, it was um, meeting lots of different people, different backgrounds. Um, it was just, just a nice warm feeling. Once you got there, it just felt like it was family. It felt yeah. like it was where you're supposed to be. And everybody was like friendly and helpful. And yeah, it was just such a, a lovely feeling. Yeah, really great. Well, it was great to eat together, wasn't it? But obviously it when was. we had to, to change that and, and go online, it was a bit different. So Lindsay, do you think it still works online when you don't get to eat together first? Yes, absolutely. It, it's been, obviously we've had a lot going on at the moment and it's just been nice to have everyone come together and just feel like a family and a community and have that routine, but also still continue on with the journey. And there's, as you say, there's no judging anything and it's just so relaxed and really wonderful. Definitely, definitely love it. Fantastic. So haven't had chance to chat um, with, with all those other people about what life is all about and what happens after death and stuff like that. Do you think that's made a difference to your life? Yeah, it's made me more open to um, discovering more about God and finding out you know, what our path is and how he can help 
me and help others around me yeah definitely yeah. fantastic okay and finally would you guys recommend alpha and and would you recommend alpha online 100 yeah. percent. yeah <laughs> definitely it's definitely worth doing fantastic well i'm so glad you enjoyed it thank you very much for joining me today i hope that's inspired you to register your interest to book a place look for alpha on our social media or our website and i'll see you there Hi friends, while we are going through this global crisis, while I've been feeling for those who are suffering in the Western world, uh, my heart's also been going out for those in the developing world who I've really been concerned about the impact of this virus on them. And last week I was uh, reading in Luke 16 and uh, reading the story of the rich man and Lazarus and uh, lots of different things can come out of that story. But one of the take homes has got to be this, that those who are materially well, well off in this life should not forget the poor that we are called to remember the poor. And uh, as I read that story, it provoked me again to pray, to pray for our friends and the, and the stories that were uh, uh, emerging, to cry out to God. And during a coffee break, as I was praying, an email from our good friend Sam Amara in Lagos came to my attention. And let me read you some of it. It's a very difficult situation here in Lagos with the extension of the lockdown for another 14 days. I'm afraid many family will starve to death. Last week, a single mother with three kids called for help, saying for some days they've not eaten anything. On Monday, the leader of one of our churches called, crying that his people are starving to death. I'm running out of food stuff. I'm running out of money to support people. And then another email from our friend Jonathan in Liberia. Dear friends, I'm strongly convinced that the good of COVID-19 will surely come out. However, we need your prayers now in Liberia during this lockdown. There are no national plans in place for the majority very poor and jobless people. More than 70% of the population survive either by daily hiring or trading. Community clinics are closed, which will lead to many people dying from other diseases untreated. There's no safe drinking water supply, no electricity, no medication for treating other diseases. Under these circumstances, we have a state of emergency. Many people might just die, not because of the COVID-19, but because of hunger and lack of medical care. Please pray for us as we go through this global pandemic under these extreme circumstances. These are, these are our friends. These are church leaders that we know and that we trust. And we've had similar calls for help from Pakistan and from Uganda and from Kenya and from others. And as I, I read these words, I was prompted to go out and pray again and say, God, please help us to help these people. And, and I felt the Lord speak to me and said, Simon, raise £100,000 in the next three weeks. And so I immediately took that word, this was last Wednesday, I immediately took that word uh, to uh, the Catalyst Strategy team. And uh, we have, are of one heart that this is what we should do. We are concerned for the future financially in the West, but we recognise that our friends in the, in the developing world are starting to starve now. And, and we've got to stand with them and we've got to give now and we've got to trust God with all of our futures and so can I ask you if you'd be willing to give into this fund? It's going to be for emergency food and medical supplies. And I'd urge you to join with us and give into it. We want to bring relief to our friends in churches in some of these countries in the developing world. And we've worked out that in many of these countries, you can feed someone for a month for between 10 to 20 pounds. And so no matter how little you can give, if, can I encourage you to give towards this fund. We, we, we estimate if we can raise 100,000, we can feed somewhere between four to 8,000 people for a month. And we're really wanting to stand with them in this time. 100% of it's gonna be spent on the supplies. There's no staff costs or salary costs or overheads in any way. 100% will be spent on the supplies and we will get the money to the situations that need it. One thing that we're keen to do is to give uh, through uh, to, to provide the money through local and support local markets and uh, inf existing infrastructure so that what we give in the emergency doesn't undermine uh, and uh, destabilize the local economy. So can I urge you to pray and to stand with us in this season, to give what you can towards this emergency fund, and we're going to trust God to do miracles and to save lives and to put his, our future into his hands together as a wider family. Thanks so much for listening. And there'll be details along with this video that you can give. Thanks so much.